Alrighty, peoples, this is Ross. So I am like super excited in this video because I really want to inspire you guys to grow melons at home, particularly to grow some really interesting varieties that I'm going to discuss in this video. Um, I had a melon really a few years ago when I made a, I took a trip to Japan and I got to experience what probably was a very expensive melon there. Um, and it turned out to be something that really blew me away. I was really, I think from that moment on, realized that I was deprived as almost a 30 year old here in the United States, deprived of something so amazing. We just don't have the quality of melons available to us here in the United States. So it's really quite a shame unless you grow them yourself and unless you grow these really special varieties. So I've made it my mission since then coming back from Japan to really try to enjoy that for myself. And I've had some challenges along the way. We've been growing melons now. I think this will be our our fourth year. And we've been growing them, by the way, in different ways. I've done two years now of growing them vertically up trellises or up uh, EMT poles. I've also had one year, actually two years now, of growing them along the ground um, in a more natural um uh, normal way of growing melons. Uh, so I've gotten some experience, good and bad. We've learned quite a bit. Um, last year was definitely by far our most successful year in terms of the sheer amount of fruits that we got, even the bricks of the amount of the fruits that we got, the sugar quality of the fruits that we got, all of that. Although we made a few crucial mistakes, and I think we really are going to fine tune this this year. And I've dedicated a lot of my garden space this year to growing melons. Um, also, a lot of my attention this year is going to be dedicated towards growing melons. So I really wanted to make this video uh, to explain all that to you guys and also really talk about these varieties. So uh, really quickly, just about how I'm going to grow them is that we're going to grow them vertically like the Japanese commercial growers do. And I've talked about that in prior videos, but essentially you grow them um, up a string or up a trellis and you can limit the number of uh, melons that each variety produces or each plant produces. You space them actually quite densely. Uh, a lot of the commercial growers have really warm soil temperatures. They plant them in almost like planter boxes. They even fumigate the soil to eliminate potentially any diseases present. Maybe even some uh, root knot nematodes. Um, and then they uh, grow them vertically underneath greenhouses. And with all the heat that they get in those greenhouses, with the perfect environment that they have, they're able to produce actually a really high quality product and really not a whole lot of space. Um, and actually do it in a pretty productive manner. I think it's uh, really quite incredible uh, how amazing some of these growers are. So we're going to try to do that, believe it or not but not in a greenhouse. And it really is kind of a shame. I think just by making that statement, I'm already shooting myself in the foot, you know, um, by not having them in a greenhouse, they're going to be more susceptible to pests, diseases, having too much water, therefore lowering the fruit quality. Uh, also not having enough heat, um, constructing a trellis perhaps that may not be as beefy as I'd like it to be. Uh, there's so many things that unfortunately, um, are not really in my favor. However, we really do have a good chance, I think, of making this work. And that's my goal, is to find something that's gonna work here, not only a variety, but a method. So that's what we're gonna do, is we're gonna grow them up trellises, up strings. We're gonna construct a really, um, I think, an ingenious trellis that actually Josh, uh, Josh uh, Satin at Satin Hill Farms had created. He did a YouTube video on it. I think it's quite brilliant. We'll see. We may have to get a little bit creative to support the fruits. I know some people are very afraid of growing melons vertically because they think the melons are not going to be able to hang on the vine. I've done it now for three years growing them vertically. And I have to say, uh, there's nothing really to worry about. Yes, yeah, some of the larger varieties you're going to have to support. Some of the varieties that uh, come off on their own and break away from the vine, um, those you have to keep an eye on. So this is not really something for everybody. This is something for people who are really into this, want to do this well, um, and want to have this experience that I'm that I had in Japan. 
Uh, so let's kind of now talk about some of these varieties really quickly. We have actually 24 that we're gonna grow and we're growing them in a 36 square foot area, believe it or not. Um, each melon plant is spaced one and a half foot apart. So there's four rows of them and each row is spaced uh, one and a half feet apart. In between the rows is only a foot. So really there's not a whole lot of space for these melon plants to grow. Um, it really is quite dense. It really is going to be a challenge. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, and I've talked about some other methods and things, how I'm going to potentially alleviate that. We'll talk about that as we go down in the, uh, in the season, as we get closer to actually planting them and growing them and doing the different things that we're going to do. Um, but that's sort of how we're doing it is, uh, that's the spacing. Those are the varieties, um, quite incredible, right? So the first thing I think that should be addressed, believe it or not, is that we're going to grow them on a squash rootstock. And this helps with a number of different reasons, particularly vigor, higher yields, stress, um, actually getting them off to a better start because a lot of these squash varieties don't require a you know as a ridiculously high soil temperature that some of these melon varieties do. So they're going to get off to a better start to the season. They're going to um, obviously if they get to a better start of the season, then they're going to ripen at an earlier point in the season. And then they're going to be at a better fruit quality. I think really my keys are going to be as much sunlight as possible, as little water as possible, and then also getting them to ripen at the right time of the year. The earlier I think we get these melons to produce in my yard, the better they're going to taste. So sunlight for the sugars, you know, keeping them disease and pest free. And th this also really helps with that, by the way, is that these squash rootstocks, these plants are really quite uh, resistant to things like powdery mildew, vine borers, even some of them have like root knot nematode resistance and other soil um, <clears throat> disease resistance like um, uh, Fusarium wilt, which is actually a really ridiculous problem that I have for um, for my uh, my melon plants and my cucumber plants. So this is really, I think, extremely key. However, looking into grafting vegetables and grafting annuals, I've never done it. It doesn't seem to be that difficult, but it does seem to be something that can be a bit tricky. So it may take me a season. Maybe I have to do this two or three times to really get this right, but I may have to really struggle with this to get this to be a success. Um, now, a lot of people, believe it or not, a lot of commercial growers who actually do graft these things have something called a healing chamber, I think it's called, where essentially you put, after grafting these plants, you put them in the chamber at almost 100% humidity, warmer temperatures, and if you do everything right with the clips, with the precision of the knife, um, with your timing and all that, you can have yourself some really successful melon plants. So that's kind of really what we're doing here. This is one, by the way, Tetsuka Buto is one of the standard varieties of grafting for cucumbers and melons onto something that's uh, a much better, um, you know, a much better grower. So yeah, again, you can read through this on their website here on Johnny's. It's, uh, it's quite incredible, I think, and we'll see. So another thing we've been doing over the years when it comes to these varieties is that I, I've gotten myself, uh, really done my research on what varieties I think I should grow and Amy Goldman has always been a pretty good inspiration this is her new book actually it came out I think last year oddly enough I was interviewed on a podcast on Stephen Biggs's podcast we talked about figs and believe it or not that same interview Amy Goldman was interviewed right before me um, <clears throat> little does she know that I'm such a big fan of hers I got her prior book, um, I forget the name of it, it might be called the uh, Heirloom Melon or, uh, no, it's Melons for the Passionate Grower, I believe. And then I realized that she actually has a new book. So I went out and bought this. I think I got it for around 30 to $35. It's definitely got more information in here in terms of growing melons, which I really wanted to actually talk to Amy Goldman if I ever had the chance or the time 
was to contact her and figure out really how to grow these things to the best of my ability, but also uh, pick her brain on some of these varieties. Now, she did also include more information in general about these varieties, updated her thoughts on some of them. Um, there's really good information. There's this whole stat sheet in the back about the bricks, the vigor, the ripening period, where you can even get them, synonyms for the variety, uh, the size, the weight, what classification of melon that it is, um, and then a whole description of the melon. And it's really, uh, really, I think it's totally worth buying this particular book. So going through both of her books, by the way, doing as much research online as I could, I put together a list of 24 melon varieties I think that are, are really worth at least trialing um, for someone in, that wants to do this alongside me. And maybe you guys are doing this in a future year. Um, additionally, though, I will make this one caveat is that, you know, Amy Goldman's really about the heirlooms and there's nothing wrong with heirlooms. I personally love heirlooms. I think they're a huge deal. I think she's doing great work with seed, with seed savers exchange and preserving them and reintroducing people to these melons. I think her work is fantastic. So I really commend her for that. However, I think it's a shame that she's not doing the same thing for these hybrid melon varieties. I think there's a lot of genetics out there and we shouldn't be, um, it's not, it's, it's okay to be preferential to one, uh, type of genetics. Like it's okay to be preferential to heirlooms and prefer them over hybrids. I, I get that. But when we're trying to find some of the best tasting melons that exist, I think we can't just ignore hybrids. I think it's just foolish. Now, I don't think Amy Goldman has ignored hybrids. I seriously doubt that. Um, I do think she probably for whatever reason, just values the heirlooms much more than she does the hybrids. Maybe, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but maybe she came to some sort of conclusion that the heirlooms are just superior and almost in most way, in terms of flavor and texture and things like that. And really what makes these melons beautiful and, and fantastic is that it's really all about the flavor. And for me, it's all about the flavor. So if I find you know, like a lot of these, let's say, tomato varieties that unfortunately um, got a lot of the flavor bred out of them. Um, you know, it would be just a total shame to find out that some of these hybrid melon varieties are in a similar state and that there isn't a whole lot of hybrid melon, a whole, whole lot of hybrid tomato varieties, excuse me, that really can compete at all in terms of flavor with a lot of the heirloom tomato varieties. You know, it's very difficult to beat a pink brandywine in terms of flavor. Having said that, there's gotta be some exceptions to the rule. So I'm not only gonna grow heirlooms, but also hybrids. And I, I wanna make that clear is that we're not being totally preferential to one or the other. We're really just trying to find what are the best tasting melons that also perform well here. Um, under the current growing conditions and circumstances. Now, I will make this one claim that I seriously doubt, and Amy Goldman really is the one giving me this faith, but Amy Goldman and, and so many other growers believe that this particular variety here, the Petite Grease de Rene melon, is the best tasting melon in existence. Now, Maybe not existence. I don't want to say that. I don't want to put those words in her mouth, but certainly she mentioned that in both of her books over a span, I think, of like almost 20 years that she's been growing um, or pub has published books now on melons. Um, I think she's been growing melons over 50 years, and this is the one I think that she just absolutely loves. And I hear this, again, so many times now. I would argue probably there's got to be something in Japan that could be even be better than this. I, I would think there's probably these pro proprietary varieties that exist there that are not available here that make such a big difference in the, the quality of their melons. So I would be really interested at some point in the future to trial more of these um, Japanese melon varieties uh, that have been bred 
for this particular exquisite flavor. So, but the petite grease, I think we can probably put to bed, at least in the United States, is probably the best tasting melon. Now, it doesn't mean that it doesn't come with its problems because it's not easy to grow. It's uh, really quite finicky in a sense. Uh, you know, Amy Goldman even mentions that. If, and if you're not really one of the better melon growers, you really don't fine tune your craft, you may not even have success with it. So she does mention that and um, I may not have success with it. Um, particularly people, by the way, guys, that are in these climates like myself that are in a, just a colder climate, shorter season, doesn't maybe get as warm in the, in the, in the, uh, the summertime. And then also maybe it's a bit too wet, right? Because some of these melon varieties will really struggle with disease and pest pressure. So um, I have really high hopes that I'm going to have success with this one grafted. However, here's my second best option. Is It's called Grisolette. And this is a Johnny's hybrid here. I, I don't know if Johnny's created it, but they certainly are offering it. And this apparently is the hybrid version of the heirloom Petite Grease de Rene. It looks and tastes like the uh, French original, but is protected by modern disease resistance. Um, creamy and smooth, practically melts in your mouth, can be cut from the vigorous, healthy vines when the skin yellows and the rind gives slightly from your touch. High res highly resistant to Fusarium wilt races one, two, and three. That's incredible right there. Uh, intermediate resistance to blight. I'm not seeing any resistance, unfortunately, to mildew, which is really quite important in my yard. But um, that it just right there just blows me away. So this one, if all else fails, I feel like this, if I, let's say if I just grew this melon, I feel like I probably would be happy. Like I probably, um, could settle for just growing this particular melon. I may even um, try to grow a couple plants of this potentially at the, the community garden as well this year and grow them along the ground and just see how they do. Um, so interesting, right? Super, super interesting there that they've actually bred something like this because as we said, right, some of the people have preferential treatment to the heirlooms over the the hybrids and i think a lot of the focus nowadays is really focusing not only on the flavor but also how it performs um so really super excited to have found this found seeds of this um, and to be able to grow it another one we're going to grow here is the ambrosia melon this one for it seems like for a hybrid as well it just seems like it's one of the best tasting melons uh you know, I don't know how else to really describe it through my research, uh, through all the different websites and descriptions and things I've read. It just seems like the ambrosia really has a higher reputation than most melons for being quite tasty. Um, four to four and a half pounds. I would probably say if we're getting over the five pound mark for our melons and we're growing them vertically, we may struggle with having to support them um, along the vine. So this one I'm actually quite excited for. The next one here is called Passport. And these are Gallia types. Again, it's actually quite large. Um, I haven't necessarily grown a Gallia type melon. And I'm going to be honest with you, they're probably quite difficult to grow. However, this one is uh, really early to ripen. And a lot of these hybrids, believe it or not, it's, it's really quite interesting. A lot of them end up being really early. And then it makes it a lot more, you know, achievable to be actually to be able to grow them here in this climate so i kind of value um, the hybrids for that particular reason whereas maybe like let's say a gallia type melon that wasn't a hybrid um, i probably would have really a lot more struggles growing it so we're going to find out we're going to see i again i have higher hopes for this one to see again what the deal is another hybrid here is called uh, hannah's choice this one was bred at cornell this one has a, been around for a while. Um, it's got a better reputation than most. Um, you can see the resistances here. That's pretty good. Of intermediate to all these different problems. Aromatic, very sweet, full of flavor. I think, again, through most of my 
um, inquiries and research, it does seem like it's one of the better tasting melons that is uh, among a hybrid. Now, another one here that I gets a really great reputation from Amy Goldman, and I guess we could really kind of talk more about the, the heirlooms here, is that Noir de Carmes is, by a lot of accounts, one of the better tasting cantaloupes. And I think we've mentioned this in other videos, but really there's two different types of melons that people in my, cli my, my climate should really be paying attention to. Um, one is actually the cantaloupe, and the other is actually musk melon. Now, there's really no such thing as honeydew. Um, honeydew is its own variety, believe it or not, of musk melon. And you can grow the wet, the green fleshed variety of honeydew, or even an orange fleshed variety of honeydew. So, when we think about melons, that's sort of how Americans really view them: is that there's two different types, cantaloupe and and um, and honeydew. But believe it or not, even the cantaloupes and even the honeydew, both of them are really technically that you see at the grocery store, technically musk melons. They're not cantaloupes by uh, true definition. So the cantaloupes here that I've been mentioning, you can really easily tell that they're cantaloupes and classified as that because they have a smoother exterior, kind of like a pumpkin, whereas musk melons produce a netting. And this is the netting that you typically typically see on the melons grown um, at the stores because they're all really, you know, um, they're all really the, the cantaloupes or honeydews, right? And they're technically musk melons. Again, the Petit Gris de Rene, this is also a cantaloupe. And by most accounts, the cantaloupes are really some of the most exquisitely flavored um, melons in the world. Um, you could definitely make an argument that the musk melons are also equally as good tasting. However, it seems like to me that the Sharon Tay type melons or the cantaloupe type melons maybe have a more complex, interesting flavor, whereas maybe some of the um, some of the musk melons kind of make up for their loss in flavor with a higher level of sweetness. Um, that's certainly the case with uh, with honeydew as an example. It's really one of the sweetest varieties of musk melon that you can find. Um, so I think it's really f it's not fair to talk about these cantaloupes unless we talk about the Charente type melon. And that is really, I think, other than maybe the Noir de Carmes, other than the Petite Gris, de Rene, it's really, in my opinion, or in Amy Goldman's opinion, probably that classic variety of cantaloupe that most people should really pay attention to and most people know right off the bat. Um, let's see here. I could read you something from her book here on the Charente. Um, by the way, we're going to talk about the Charente type melons because I'm going to be growing hybrids of the Charente, the actual Charente itself, um, different versions of it as we go. So it says here, Charente is a refined cantaloupe, smooth skinned, smooth skinned, free of blemishes and warts, round or sometimes flattened at the poles with tan or gray lobes. Its dark green furrows guide the knife where to cut. Uh, that's another thing is that it has these furrows, these ridges in the in the skin usually. As you can see here is another one. This one may not be smooth in the exterior, but it has ridges in it that really differentiate it from the musk melon. <clears throat> yeah, so it's uh, it's just something that's been around in France for a very long time. It says here four Charente lookalifes were painted between 1515 and 1518 in Rome. It says Charentes was known and grown by the uh, Charente region of Western France around 1920, and by 1946 it become it had become uh, the leading market type melon in France. So it's got a rich history to it, and uh, certainly it's you know arguably one of the better melons in the world. So the Charente is just one that we're going to be looking at. Um, and of course, Noir de Carmes being another type of cantaloupe, 
should equally have a very aromatic, amazing uh, tasting fruit. It says here that it's uh, one of the easiest to grow, the most luxurious of all melons. So that's a really good sign. Obviously, complex, deeply satisfying, all really good things that you want to hear uh, about a particular melon that you're going to grow. Let's continue. This one's called Zata, and uh, this is an Italian one. And I found this one on Seeds of Italy, but after getting uh, Amy Goldman's newest book, she actually mentions it in her book, and it's one of her favorites. So it's got a high reputation. Definitely one of the tastiest. A little ugly, but I think it's beautiful. The flesh is a really a salmon orange. Um, fantastic. Again, another um, you know melon that uh, should rival some of the best melons. Now, moving on, I actually found, believe it or not, some Japanese melon seeds from Kitazawa. Uh, Kitazawa is really good at getting some of the more Asian varieties into the United States and uh, making them accessible to people. And these are two that I found to be worth growing on their website. This is a, a hybrid called Hakucho. It's a Charente type from Japan. Uh, salmon orange color, aromatic, sweet, just over one pound. They say it's a superior melon with a 16% bricks, which is incredible. Any melon with like over 14 is just considered ridiculously high bricks. Uh, that's one thing about the Petite Grease, by the way, that Amy Goldman mentions in her book is that it just is a extremely sweet cantaloupe at 14 bricks, actually, which is really quite something. So um, hopefully Grisolette has the same bricks that I'm looking for as well. But uh, Cucho is definitely one of them here um, that seems to be very interesting. Also this Ichiba Kuji, I think I'm not pronouncing that right, I'm sure. Uh, specialty variety that dominates the netted melon market in Japan. Fruit is round, green skin, fine net, matures over three pounds. Thick, juicy green flesh measures, again, 16 bricks. Sugar content will continue to rise regardless of the weather. Easy to grow, widely adaptable. So that's awesome. This might be potentially the melon that I tasted in Japan. Who knows? Really excited to try it. Um, moving on. So this one here is called Dove. And I think... Um, Dove is, believe it or not, a, yeah, I don't know if it is a musk melon, perhaps. It says cucumus mellow, um, but as you know, I've stated, there are different types, and there's actually a third group here. There's the cantaloupes, there's the musk melons, and then there's a third group here called the Inodorus group, which are called winter melons. And the inner Doris melons comprise of a, a very large cultivar group, commonly known as cassavas or winter melons. Spanish types are prominently represented, including Amarillo, Piel de Sapo, Ro Roche, Tendril, uh, as are melons from Turkey, the Santa Claus melon, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the cassava melons are some of the sweetest melons in the world. However, they require a more desert-like climate that's not similar to my own. So these are more difficult to grow here in my location, and I decided to try to avoid as many of these as possible. But I do feel like the dove melon could be under that category. I really don't know. And it says here that the, the netting is scant, and I don't know. It says it's an Ananas type, which could mean that, oh yeah, it says right there, originating in the Mideast, Ananas is a type of white, white fine flesh netted musk melon that develops considerable sweetness. So, yeah, it's apparently a musk melon. So there you go. However, we'll get to this in, in no Doris group in just a minute because we are growing one, a couple, I think, in that particular group. But again, this one seems like it has some, some potential. If you read the description on Fedco, it does seem worth growing. I love Dove, so do my restaurant buyers. Maybe the earliest, easiest, and sweetest melon you'll ever grow. And it has a 15.5 bricks, which is pretty darn incredible. Now, the bricks can be a bit subjected to where you're taking the juice from. Like, you you know, the refractometer, you need the juice on the refractometer to get a bricks reading. If you take the juice right from the center of the melon, it's going to be sweeter. If you take it from the exterior, 
it probably is going to be a lot less. So I don't know really how much I can rely on these BRICS readings. We're going to find out. The Dove Melon uh, seems really early and easy to grow, so it seems like a no-brainer if it is indeed uh, as sweet as um, they say. It says the sweetest melon you'll ever grow. Uh, let's keep going here. So this one was actually recommended by a viewer after I was complaining last year that I didn't get sweet melons and I couldn't figure out why it was. And uh, a lot of it I attribute to actually the genetics of the melons that I was growing. And uh, someone recommended this melon here. It's called the Main Street, Mainstream Cantaloupe. And it says here, it's a versatile melon that ranks high in taste, storage, and shipping capability. Three to four pounds, holds extremely well under wet or humid conditions in our trials. It had a, it was really the taste of the variety was superior to other varieties, bright orange, thick, firm, mild flavor. And according to the viewer that mentioned this melon to me, the bricks is I believe 16 as well. So very interesting if that's the case to see really if it can do that here in this climate um, and how it ends up working out. The next one here is this uh, Sensation Melon, another hybrid. Um, this one just seemed really interesting to me. Um, it's a whiter flesh melon, which I am not growing that many of. Um, let's see here. Very sweet but not cloying with perhaps the highest bricks of any melon in the catalog. Complex too with haunting hits of hazelnut, hazelnut amaretto, and cinnamon. So very unlike French orange and not fitting into any the usual classes of melons. So for me it seems different, also very highly tasting. Why not try to grow it? A bit later in the season at 85 days, but uh, yeah, I mean, wow, right? The next one here is uh, Sugar Cube. And again, trying to get higher bricks fruits, this one has a reputation for being very sweet. I don't know if this one's gonna be the best, but it does say it lives up to his name to its intensely sweet flavor. Well suited for northern and southern regions. High resistance to a lot of the diseases I deal with. So potentially this could be something uh, that's maybe not the best tasting, but maybe more of a standard that I try to grow here in my yard. Moving on to a bunch of heirlooms actually that you can find on Seed Savers Exchange. The Haogen is a, actually an Israeli melon that was grown at a kibbutz, apparently. They save the seeds. It's a cantaloupe. As you can tell, it's really beautiful and one of the best tasting melons uh, there is. Also really one of uh, Amy Goldman's favorites, and as well as this one here. It's called uh, the Prescott Frond, Fond Blanc. This one's a bit larger, has uh, sort of weird bumps on the skin, which are really beautiful in my opinion um, that you normally see on some squash varieties as the melons are indeed related to squash that's why we can actually graft onto them this is one of her favorites uh, she really really likes this one she says it's a it's a rock type melon let's see if we can read something about this in her book very quickly By the way, she says the Petite Riz de Rene is so good that it gives her chills. All right, Prescott Fond Blanc, once a favorite of French market gardeners, is now a favorite of mine. Ethereal, deeply furrowed, puffy-looking melon reminds me of dough rising. I love my, love to run my fingers over its deeply furrowed, warded, rock-hard shell and to smell true cantaloupe. Let's see here. Although it is less meaty than some of the more efficient modern melons, tasting one is an experience not to be missed. And uh, believe it or not, the Prescott name is really a type of different varieties. There's a, a number of different Prescott type melons. And uh, it has a recessed stem, a large round scar at the, at the blossom end, and it grows on vigorous vines with dark tooth-like leaves. So... Um, savory flesh, dense and sweet. And it really is just overall beautiful as well as very tasty. So uh, definitely recommend you guys try it. 
uh, based off of Amy Goldman's really awesome review here. The Pride of Wisconsin is one for me that I think might be a bit too big. We're going to find out. I think that one probably is going to be my largest. And it actually is quite similar to another variety that I was considering growing uh, called uh, Shoon's Hard Shell that actually Amy Goldman recommends as well. But she says they're very similar. Um, and I'm not going to fight her on that if that's the case. They're similar in appearance, similar in flavor, yada, yada, yada. It's very easy. It's much easier to find uh, seeds of pride of Wisconsin. And we'll see if it, if it really can uh, withstand the weight um, while being trellised vertically. It's actually a very early uh, muskmelon of a good size. It's good in short season areas. So definitely seems to be something that you know across the board is one of the better varieties in my climate so we'll see if it if it really tastes as good as some of these other ones all right let's keep moving on here we talked about the Sharon Tay um, here's the collective farm woman so this is the actually in the Inodorus group that I was mentioning these melons are really from the Middle East or desert like climates and it's a bit difficult unfortunately to grow them here however this one is mid-season um, as Amy Goldman says it's small but packs a ton of goodness add her to your list of must-have melons so for me that's enough right she says the first time I tried one, I had low expectations the whole fruit is as hard as a dense as a baseball and gives off only a mild fragrance when ripe um, but it really seemed to impress her over the years, and there you go. It's actually from Ukraine. And introduced by a woman from Belarus, I guess. So quite interesting, that's for sure. Um, again, not your typical type of melon that you would think about growing, as it, as it says. It's a winter melon, it stores well. However, it is actually quite tasty with a 13.5% bricks, which is really quite high. Although some of the winter melons here can be very sweet, um, like Amarillo, Oro, and uh, quite a few other of the cassava type melons. Eden's Gem. This is another musk melon. Again, complex, good flavor all around. One of the better melons that uh, Amy Goldman recommends. She talks about it. There's another melon called Ford Hook Gem that's very similar, and Burpee was the one to really uh, introduce that one. It says, introduced by Burpee in 1967 as a distinctive melon, usually prolific, that fares even well in the north. Um, he was like absolutely in love with that melon, apparently. As he said, it was the best green flesh melon he's ever eaten. So... Ford Hook Gem is difficult to find, but Eden's Gem is apparently very similar, according to uh, Amy Goldman. And it's a really quite available thanks to the Seed Savers Exchange. And again, uh, it's got 11% bricks, smaller melon, mid season. All right, Milan is one actually that I figured I should grow. It's an early Tuscan type melon with uh, superior flavor. Aromatic, sweet, juicy Italian melon with uh, pronounced sutures, small seed cavity. Um, yeah, it seems really well worth growing. I can't necessarily, uh, you know, say too much about it, obviously, but they do say it has a superior flavor. So we'll find out. Obviously, very partial to the Italian type melons uh, having Italian ancestry. The next one here is called Savor. We grew this one last year got a ton of fruits it does produce a lot of fruits it wasn't very sweet though and I think the sweetness is gonna come in really by honing in our techniques as I've mentioned uh, getting them more sunlight the plants more sunlight also getting um, you know them to ripen at an earlier date I think we're gonna have success this year this one really didn't seem like it was very difficult to grow at all so I'm really quite impressed with it um, although it did have the intermediate resistance to powdery mildew, and I think that's where it really failed at the very end of my season. The next one's Alvaro, and by the way, 
Savor is just your typical Charente. So it's a, a hybrid of the Charente and hopefully a hybrid could be better or maybe tastier somehow in some way better than your typical Charente. The Alvaro is the same thing. And again, it says here, a class of cantaloupe notoriously slow to ripen and difficult to harvest ripe without splitting. Um, as these melons actually, they ripen, they're kind of fully ripe when it kind of splits open, believe it or not. So you want to want to catch it as it splits open. If it's open for too long, it can start to ferment um, and actually lose flavor. But uh, certainly it's one that is really well worth growing. Uh, it says here, the ideal Sharon taste eluded our trialers for years until they found Alvaro. It makes the mystery out of growing Sharon Tay. So it's easy to pick. Um, it's early, matured around the same time as Holona. Way earlier than any Sharon Tay they tried. Um, good uniformity. So again, it should be a very good tasting melon. Firm texture, full rich bodied flavor. So again, a decent alternative. The last one here is called Delicious 51. And this one actually is an, an heirloom in Amy Goldman's book. It is a musk melon, early, 12 and a half bricks. The first early meaty, delicious, orange fleshed musk melon of the highest table quality. So it's one of the earliest melons that I think she what she's saying is that it's got a better flavor developed by Henry Munger at Cornell in 1951 so it was a hybrid at one point um, obviously resistant to fusarium wilt let's see here hmm Yeah, it just seems like uh, obviously a very good melon. So she highly has a lot of things good to say about it. And it should do pretty well here, I imagine. So there you guys have it. 42 minutes later, we did it. We got through all the varieties. I hope you guys will try some of these. Um, check out some of the nurseries I've, I've mentioned here. I think this person here, Urban Farmer, I've never bought seeds from them, but they got a great website. And... Uh, they definitely seem like they have their stuff together. I love Fedco, also Baker Creek, Johnny's, the Seed Savers, they're doing great work. And also the Seeds of Italy that we mentioned, Will Height. Um, yeah, interesting. So I think you guys should give all these, uh, definitely these carriers a try, see what the deal is. Um, and definitely figure out if you guys want to grow these things um, and report back to me. You know, Follow along in the season as we do this. Is we're going to update you guys, but let me know as well when I do these videos how you guys are doing. I really hope the crafting works out. I hope I can keep my plants mostly disease-free with the help of uh, some Dynagro Protect. We're also going to basically plant them, I think, underneath... Um, some low tunnels to start, maybe for the entire month of May. Um, we're also gonna be really careful, I think, about um, forcing them to fruit when we want, kind of like pinching our figs to then get a melon about 30 to 45 days later after it has set. Um, and that way we can time this thing to get these melons ripening at the most optimal time of the season. So we will take very special care of these melons this year. I, I hope it all works out. If the grafting doesn't work out, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world, but um, I'm going to really try hard to make that work. And we'll see you guys soon for the next video. Take care, everybody.